సోమేశ్వర్ గారు థ్యాంక్ యూ సోన్ గుడ్ ఈవెనింగ్ డాక్టర్స్ దిస్ ఇస్ డాక్టర్ సోమేశ్వర్ ఫ్రమ్ షీల్డ్ హెల్త్ కేర్ ఐ వెల్కమ్ యూ ఆల్ ఆన్ బిహాఫ్ ఆఫ్ షీల్డ్ థ్యాంక్ యూ వెరీ మచ్ ఫర్ జాయినింగ్ టుడేస్ వెబినార్ ఐ రిక్వెస్ట్ ఆల్ ద డెలిగేట్స్ టు ప్లీజ్ డూ write your questions in the comment box so that at the end of the webinar we'll have a short q and a session so now let me welcome our today's eminent speaker dr sai lakshmi dayana ma'am who graduated from usmania medical college hyderabad and she pursued her higher degrees in ops and gynecology and gynecology and oncology in uk msc og and md from university of manchester and sub specialty training in gynecology and oncology and she trained and worked in uk for almost 18 years and her last post was as a consultant in surgical gynecological oncology for 3 years at st james institute of oncology leeds uk since she has moved to india in september 2016 she has taken up the post of consultant surgical gynecological oncology at the apollo institute of cancer in hyderabad she is a cancer surgeon and experienced at performing open laparoscopic robotic procedures for gynecological cancers like ovarian uterine cervix vagina and vulva she is also trained in gynecology with 20 years of experience and expertise in dealing menstrual problems pelvic pain and menopause issues and with this uh, i conclude my introduction and coming to the today's topic that is uh, latest in cervical cancer screening and prevention as we know that this is the uh fourth most common uh, cancer uh among the cancers so now let me welcome dr sai lakshmi dana ma'am to talk on latest in cervical cancer screening and pre- prevention over to you ma'am thank you dr sumeshwar i used a lot of your slides this time I really liked your slides thank and you, a ma'am. very good evening to all the audience out there uh today i'm going to just highlight on some take home messages about cervical screening and prevention i'm going to focus less on cancer and more on how we should prevent this cancer as we all know if there is one cancer in this world which can be completely preventable that's cervical cancer who as such says that about 50% cancers are preventable you know cancer is one diagnosis which we dread which patients dread which families dread everybody dreads the word cancer in fact even at times when you know when covid was so scary the word i think there was one disease which was more scary than covid itself and that was cancer it always remains to be a scary disease because it's a life threatening illness as we all know and actually 50% of cancers are preventable and by that we mean cancers caused due to cigarette smoke cancers caused due to alcohol cancers caused due to h pylori hepatitis b cancers caused due to obesity all these cancers can be prevented if 50% are prevented then the other 50% cannot be prevented obviously because that's because of a mutation which can happen to even very healthy people so a healthy person can get a mutation can get leukemia lymphoma or something some cancers are genetic but lifestyle associated cancers 50% of them are preventable you could be the healthiest person on the planet and still get colonic cancer because you got a mutation but unlike that cervical cancers and any hpv cancers can be prevented by 93% so the prevention is so much higher than the other cancers that the worldwide focus the focus has always been on how do we prevent the cervical cancer and the onus of preventing the cervical cancer falls on us gynecologists if we don't do something the whole platform will fall apart how many ever screening programs the government introduces we see the majority of women we see them when they have period problems we see them in pregnancy we see them during lactation phase we see them for contraception we have so many opportunities to stop a woman and actually ask her did you undergo screening are you due for screening are you aware of screening so we need to know more about screening and how do we prevent this 
And whenever we think HPV associated cervical cancer, we always also have to remember that it is not just cervical cancer. A woman who has a hysterectomy will not get cervical cancer. So many of us might uh, ourselves have had a hysterectomy and we are not supposed to assume that, okay, my uterus is gone, I'll never get cervical cancer. So HPV doesn't only cause cervical cancer, it can cause anal cancer in people who practice anal intercourse. It can cause oropharyngeal cancer. How many of us do actually believe that 50% of mouth and throat cancers are due to HPV and oral sex? We always associate mouth cancer with tambaku, with tobacco, with pan, etc. That is what they keep drilling into our heads wherever we go, that uh, tambaku cho, or people who uh, it's, use it get oropharyngeal cancers. But how many of us do actually think that 50% of these people with mouth and throat cancers have actually got it because 10, 15, 20 years ago, they had oral sex? You know, that people are not even aware of that. Vaginal cancer is extremely rare again due to HPV. Vulval cancer is extremely rare again due to HPV. And penile cancers. We're always focusing on HPV and cervical cancers. But what about HPV causing penile cancer? So many men undergo penectomy for penile cancers. And WHO, what I'm going to talk about today is totally evidence-based. It's not what I think, it's what the governments and WHOs and our governing bodies think we should do. So this is all evidence-based what we are talking today. And according to WHO, screening should start at 30. Obviously, we all know that from the time HPV enters a woman bod woman's body, it takes 10 to 15 years. So most women are sexually start sexual activity between the ages of 20 to 30, and hence the recommended age of 30. This is not what the American College and the Royal College guidelines say. They say start at 21, 25, depending on the sexual debut. But WHO says at least start at 30. You can follow you can follow American guidelines, you can follow British guidelines, you can follow Indian guidelines, you can follow WHO guidelines, but it depends on who your patient is. I don't stick to one guideline. If my patient comes across to me like a very cosmopolitan, ultra-modern woman who is very educated, who keeps her appointments, I follow the American guidelines. If my patient is a villager who doesn't have a clue what pap test is, but who I know will never come back for follow-up, then I follow WHO guidelines. So which guideline you follow depends on you cater it to the needs of your patient. But if you want to screen, you know, if you only want to do limited number of tests because of resource issues that don't waste money on testing 20 to 30 year olds because most of them will only have low grade dysplasia even if they have it. The peak age when cervical cancer hits women is 30 to 50 so target them and instead of doing the same pap test again and again on an annual basis to a bunch of women try and do more women even if it means less number of tests. By this, I mean to Apollo, say I work in Apollo, Hyderabad, Jubilee Hills, and where I work, some women have been coming for annual master health checkups for the past 15 years. Every year when they come for a checkup, they have a pap test. The recommendation is once every three years. Sometimes I tell them, you had one last year, it was liquid based. It was in one of the best pathology labs of Apollo. Do you want another one? You know, normally I do it, but I remind them to say that, look, it's only once every three years, but they have it on a yearly basis. And then there are women who haven't had it at all. 10 years, 20 years of married life, they haven't had one. Even if you recommend it, they'll say, okay, I'll think about it next time. So sometimes we end up screening the same woman again and again and again because she's so health conscious and then a big bunch of women who have never been screened end up never being screened so if you have a choice of doing three yearly or annually on 100 women instead do it just once on thousand women that's what who says even that one pap test can pick up an abnormality screening even once in a lifetime would be beneficial and how often do you screen? And the college guidelines say once every three years, but is that possible? Like I say, sometimes I'm ending up doing once every year on so many of these women, but ideally once every three years, if you think this woman will never come back to you in three years, at least do it once. And what are the ways of doing it? What are your options? And you see with, in, uh, with acidic acid, visual inspection with acidic acid, and you treat them at the same setting. This is for that woman who you don't think will never come back to you or who might not 
follow you up. But if you have a woman who you think actually will come back for her report, who has a reliable phone number, who you could talk to and come bring her back to your clinic, then treat her like a woman who belongs to a developed country. If she's coming across like a developed country woman, treat her like one. Do a HPV test or do a pap test. And if they come abnormal, do a colposcopy, do a biopsy, get a diagnosis. So BIA in treat is a different category. And do the HPV or pap and then take a biopsy and treat accordingly is a different category. And there is no reason for us to stick to one category. We can change the categories depending on who the patient is and how the patient is. And according to WHO, the 2013 guidelines are the same as 2019 guidelines. We can do a HPV test, we can do a PAP test, or we can do VIA. And what is a HPV test? HPV test is where they're looking at HPV, where they're looking at the DNA, RNA of the HPV. And if it's more than one picogram per ml of the solution, you send it to them. It's called positive. It's taken on a liquid-based sample. So when you take a cervical smear and put it in liquid, the liquid-based cytology, which you send for PAP, the same solution is taken for HPV test. So you don't need to do a different test. You don't need to do anything different. And the cost is varying between lab to lab. And on an average, it costs around 4,000 to 5,000 rupees. And if those of you who are still doing pap tests on a glass slide, personally, if I was having a pap and I see a glass slide, I won't get it done. I'll go to a lab where they're doing liquid-based cytology because you get thousands more cells in liquid-based cytology. You will hardly ever get an inadequate smear in liquid-based cytology. More number of cells, more accurate the diagnosis. So I don't think in this day and age, there is any need for anybody to do a PAP on a slide unless a pathologist was a superb pathologist, which is a rare thing these days. So personally, I always like my patients' PAPs to go in liquid-based cytology, and uh, that is what we do at Apollo. And if you were to do your PAP, I would say send a get a liquid base done rather than a glass slide, unless you know the pathologist yourself to be a very reliable pathologist. And obviously, the machine which reads the liquid base cytology is around 20 lakh rupees, while slide is, un slide is under a microscope. So there's a huge cost variation. And that is why so many labs in our country still stick to slides for conservation of money. But I think we should all move down to liquid based. If we gynecologists refuse to do slides on glass slides, if we refuse to do PAPs on glass slides and send all our samples in liquid base to the lab, which does them liquid based, automatically people will change their practice, the labs will start to buy the machines. And it's been 15 years since we started using LBC. And I think that should be the way forward. What is co-testing? We hear the word co-testing a lot. Like I said, you take a smear, you send it in the liquid, you send it off to the lab. You could use that liquid for PAP. You could use it for HPV. There is so much material that you could actually do both. When you do both PAP and HPV, it's called co-testing. That has been more accurate, if any anything. And uh, moving on to vaccines, uh, we nine. since 2016, America has only used uh, Gardasil 16, Gardasil 9. Since 2016, which is six years ago, only vaccine in America is Gardasil 9. Gardasil 9 was uh, licensed in India in 2018, and we still don't have even a single Gardasil 9 anywhere in our country. They're still giving us the Gardasil quadrivalent because they want to use up the stocks. And we seem to be a developing country who will accept anything thrown at our face. And therefore, even though we are licensed to have Gardasil 9, it's not arrived in India yet. And I think that's that's quite sad, actually, that we just have to use up all the manufactured doses of quadri Gardasil quadrivalent before they'll give us any Gardasil nonavalent. But that seems to be the best vaccine from different types of HPV. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that's the best vaccine for cervical cancer, but from warts and other 
conditions point of view, Gardasil 9 is best. And if you can wait to get it in India, that will be great. Who is eligible for vaccine? Anybody who is not exposed to HPV, which means who has not started sexual activity. Uh, towards the end of this talk, we're going to talk about what type of sexual activity will make people prone for HPV infections. But by sexual activity, I don't just mean penetrative sexual intercourse. We'll come to that shortly. And young girls, ideally between the ages of 9 to 13, I want you to focus on the last slide here. And this is my take home message regarding vaccination. 9 to 13 is the best age to vaccinate because there is absolutely no HPV exposure to these kids. Any woman can have a vaccine as long as she does. She hasn't already had HPV. If a woman who probably has HPV wants a vaccine, give it to her. No harm done. She'll just lose some money if the vaccine doesn't work because she's already HPV positive. And you can give the vaccine up to 19, up to 26 years of age, obviously in non-sexually active people. If a child has not completed her 15th birthday, by the time you started vaccination, then you give two doses. If the vaccination program starts after the 15th birthday, then you give three doses. If a child is 15 and it turns 16 between the first and second dose, you still only give two doses. That is a WHO guideline. What about boys? Nobody, no guideline, no American college, British college or Australian or WHO said do not vaccine boys. They never said that. We do not vaccinate boys just because in a country like India, where resources are limited and vaccines are limited, if you want to protect women from cervical cancer or men from penile cancer, we focus on women. Obviously, cervical cancer is far more prevalent than penile cancer. Cervix is hidden in the body and the cancer remains unknown for a long time. Penis is visible and any small lesion, the boy, the young man's going to go and see a doctor. For whatever reason, cervical cancer is more common than penile cancer. So we're focusing on women. But say you have a patient who has a boy and a girl and you want to vaccinate the girl, then do think about vaccinating the boy because he's at risk of oral sex, penile, sorry, oral cancer cancer, throat cancer, penile cancer. If he engages in anal sex, he could get anal cancer. He could get genital warts too, for all we know. So there's absolutely no reason to say no to boys if the woman can afford vaccinating her son. By all means, do it. And the schedule is exactly the same. Talking about it, in UK, only girls are vaccinated. The boys are not given the vaccine. Why? Because UK gives free medical treatment. All the girls are getting vaccinated for free. It's taxpayers' money. So they don't want to use taxpayers' money to vaccinate boys whose risk of penile cancer is comparatively low. But if the patient is prepared to pay, then we don't need to follow these uh, uh, money saving issues, you know, so it's basically if boys are not vaccinated, it's because a government doesn't want to spend taxpayers money on men for whatever reasons we discussed, but in your uh, private paying customers do vaccinate the boys, because in USA, in Europe, and in Australia, both girls and boys are vaccinated as per their government policy. So in an ideal world, both girls and boys should be vaccinated. And we're talking about different vaccines. And again, I'm not talk, telling you everything about vaccines that you should know, because I'm sure most of you know a lot about vaccines. I'm only going to talk about the take home messages, those points which, you know, only when you read and read and you think, OK, this actually makes sense. Uh, though for warts, the Gardasil, quadrivalent and nonavalent are recommended from cancer point of view. So many papers have repeatedly said that cervix has better protection. Well, they are so hand in hand, so neck to neck that you can't say one is better than the other. But from cancer point of view, cervix is as good as Gardasil. And though it only covers 16 and 18 types, it's also it also gives cross protection. And this cross protection is being seen to types 31, 33 and 45, which are actually there in Gardasil, in Gardasil 9. So if you have a person whose budget is limited, you know, there's a difference of around 1200 rupees between Cervix and Gardasil or a family where there are two girls and they're thinking about, you know, do I need to spend so much money is in short supply, then give them Cervix. It works extremely well for cancer protection. Gardasil 9, as we all know, has been licensed and we are waiting, very eagerly waiting for it to reach India. 
And talking about screening, uh, again, we have read these guidelines innumerable times, uh, what age to start, how often to screen, and majority of us know that three years after the onset of sexual debut, we start doing pap tests, and we do them till the age of 65. In some countries between 50 and 65, they increase the interval to five years. In some countries, they do them every three years, but that is the frequency of, uh, of the screening. And uh, visual inspection with acetic acid has a role in a low resource setting. If you are a gynecologist who's got a very good practice and you are not from a low resource setting and your patients are not from a low resource setting, then please stick to the normal college guidelines where you do a pap smear and if necessary, do a colposcopy. But if you're in a low resource setting or dealing with a patient from that setting, you could do your visual inspection with acetic acid. Acetic acid is nothing but the vinegar you buy in the supermarkets. You don't need to buy concentrated and dilute it. If your lab doesn't have the facility, you can literally get 3% vinegar from the supermarket and use it as long as it doesn't have a chili flavor or a garlic flavor or anything like that. It still does the job. And management options, fine, you've done a VIA, you dipped a cotton swab, you put it in acetic acid, you put it on the woman's cervix, you see an acetovite lesion. What do you do? You haven't done VIA just to see and tell her there's an abnormality. Please never, ever, ever do a VIA. You see an acetovite lesion, then you think, okay, let's take a pap. Do not do that because you will get dead cells in your pap. The acetic acid is completely coagulated. Your cells, the cells have degenerated. The cells have died. If you then do a pap test, you won't see any cells. You'll just get disintegrated cells. So before you do your VIA, you need to have a plan of action. If it's positive, what am I going to do? That is what you need to ask yourself before you put that acetic acid and you should do something. That is the whole point of doing VIA. If you were thinking, I'll just find out if there is an abnormality, then don't do a VIA, do a PAP. So that clarity should be there for you. So you have done a VIA and then you see a positive lesion. You see a lesion which has become white, then what do you do? The advantages of VIA, how much does it cost to put a speculum dip cotton wool in acetic acid and stick it on the woman's cervix? Even your nurse could do it. You know, it barely costs few rupees. That's all these things cost less than 100 rupees. And anybody could do it. Even your assistant could do it. Even your nurse could do it. Even the Anganwadi worker could do it as long as she knows how to do a speculum. So that is how you do the VIA. How do you find out if there is CIN? CIN is a histological diagnosis. Dysplasia is a smear diagnosis. If you want to diagnose CIN, if you want to know if your patient has CIN 1, 2, or 3, then obviously you need to take a biopsy. And that, that's only possible when you do colposcopy, do acetic acid, and then you take directed punch biopsies. So if you have... If you have done VIA and there is acetovite lesion, then you do cryotherapy or you do what's called thermocoagulation. These are your two options. So if you have a woman who you want to see, you want to treat on the same setting, you're not going to do a PAP, you're going to do a VIA, then you should either have a cryo machine or you should have a thermocoagulator, which we're going to talk about in a minute. If you want to do it like in a developed country because your patient can afford and it's educated, then you take a biopsy, find out if you're dealing with CIN 1, 2, or 3, and if it is CIN 2 or CIN 3, then bring her back for a loop procedure or a LEX procedure, which is one and the same. And you can only do cryotherapy if the lesion occupies less than 75% of the ectocervix. And if it's more than 75% of the ectocervix, you can't do cryo. You have to bring that woman for a loop procedure under local or general anesthesia. Now, what do you, you say you're in a good setting where there's lots of, uh, like in a developed country, you've taken a smear and what's an abnormal smear? How do we categorize? The smear is abnormal. So what kind of abnormality is it? Let me tell you again and again and again that squamous metaplasia is not an abnorm abnormality. If on smear you see squamous metaplasia, the word squamous metaplasia, do not assume it's abnormal. I for once think that all of you already know that squamous metaplasia is a normal process which happens to any woman and it is just physiological. But if that is true, if everybody knows that squamous metaplasia is not a disease, then why am I getting so many referrals to Apollo Hospital 
from gynecologists saying, please, can you do colposcopy? This lady has an abnormal pap smear report. And when I see that, it says squamous metaplasia. This woman has already been told that she's at risk of cervical cancer. She walks into my cancer institute with a abnormal pap smear absolutely frightened with two other family members and i'm saying them this is normal this is physiological there's nothing to worry and imagine what that woman's gone through all these days so please remind yourself that the word metaplasia doesn't mean anything it's just physiological it is not so the metaplasia is not an abnormal smear then what is an abnormal smear if you have an inadequate specimen, that's abnormal because it's inadequate. So if it's an inadequate smear, obviously we say after three months, repeat the smear. If it's inadequate because you've been doing them on glass lights, please move on to liquid-based cytology. The abnormality could be due to inflammation. It could be abnormal due to infection. And then the cause we are looking for, is it abnormal because it's a precancerous lesion? Inflammatory smear, almost 50% of the smears I take come back as inflammatory. If I have to treat every inflammatory smear, then I'll be treating every alternate woman who has a pap with me. And I don't. I don't treat inflammatory smears at all. I don't know if you do, but the recommendation is you do not need to treat inflammatory smears. I only treat inflammatory smears if the woman complains of excessive uh, pathologically excessive vaginal discharge. And when I take a smear, I note if there is anything on that cervix which looks like an infection. And if it looks like just a slightly red cervix without any symptoms, I do not treat it. I just repeat the smear in three months time. The inflammation could be due to infection. Chronic cervicitis is a commonest reason, and I don't treat chronic cervicitis. It could be atrophic cervicitis in postmenopausal women, or it could be due to mechanical irritation, which they say could be tampon or douching, which usually I don't see in India. In India, barely anybody uses a tampon. And uh, so if the treatment is inflammatory, and if I see an obvious infection like bacterial vaginosis, frothy white vaginal discharge, strawberry cervix-like appearance with a lot of yucky discharge, the woman complains of pain or itching vagina, then I treat it. Otherwise, I don't. And I've colored these blocks because I want you to tell me, when would you do a smear on these ladies again? You should. You can't say your inflammatory smear is normal. Go back home. You know, inflammatory means you have to repeat it. And if it's inflammatory again, then you have to repeat it. And the recommendation, WHO recommendation, is after you treat them for infection, don't call them back in a month or two. Give them six months. Let the, Allow them time to heal. Because this is just inflammatory, non-neoplastic. So you have time. And if it's inflammatory again, then give them six more months. And in majority of the cases, inflammation settles. If it is infection, you know, usually smear cells say there is bacterial suspicious for BV, suspicious for, uh, for, bac for bacteria. So it could be trichomonas, it could be fungal, it could be bacterial, it could be actinomyces. Usually in coil bearers, we see actinomyces. I've never come across herpes simplex on a smear. I don't know if you have. And now I want you to once have a little thought, what would you treat trichomonas with? What would you treat fungal? What would you treat bacterial vaginosis with? And uh, uh, sorry, the next slide should have been there, which I accidentally removed. Trichomonas is flagell 500, 500 TDS for 400 TDS for five days, fungal with fluca, bacterial vaginosis with metrogel for five days. How many of you have had experience doing a cryotherapy? I hope all of you have, because it's one of the commonest procedures we do for ectropion, for cervical ectropion. WHO says if you're in a C and tree setup, C and treat setup, there is VIA, there's positive acetic acid lesion, then treat it, treat it with cryotherapy. If you have never used cryotherapy, it's one of the strangest experiences where the big block of ice that forms between the probe and the cervix takes a long time to melt. The probe sticks to the cervix. And once you have completed the procedure, it takes a good minute for it to come off the cervix. And if you accidentally touch the woman's vagina whilst you are in or whilst it whilst you're taking out, it causes a frostbite burn to the vagina, causes very severe pain. And one of the worst things is you put, and the treatment is for three minutes. So you put the cryo on the cervix, 
and then slowly the vaginal walls start to come onto the probe and then your heart sinks because you know that vagina will get burnt with a frostbite. I've been in this situation so many times because three minutes is a long time. Your hand can't move, your hand becomes stiff, your arm starts to ache and then the woman starts to move because three minutes is a long time and then the vaginal walls start to come, the speculum slowly starts to come out and then the vaginal walls collapse on the probe. So cryo works, it works very well but it's a bit tricky and it can be new since my personal favorite is not cryo but it definitely does the job and it's very cheap sorry this is a slide i was going to show you and how again this is a question for you where after you treat an infection for bacterial trichomonas or fungal when do you repeat the pap you repeat the pap six months later not six weeks later not two months later not a month later it's actually six months later because your smear will say bacteria visualize no neoplastic cells so you're no rush to find out if this woman has cervical cancer or not you just want to treat her infection so you give your antibiotics and ask her to come back in six months as per the who if you start actually seeing mild dyscariosis moderate severe ascus ascus h what do you do? Then you do a colposcopy and take a biopsy. That was a whole point in you doing a pap smear. You have to find an abnormality. The worst kind of abnormality is glandular abnormality. 30% of them have cancers. Squamous abnormality can be low grade or high grade. Before you tell your patient you've got a pre-cancer, before you scare her to death, just look at what type of abnormality is it. Is it low grade or high grade? If it is low grade, please don't scare her because majority of them don't turn into malignancy. And I want you to think about the answer to this question. How many of CIN3s become invasive? How many of CIN3s, which we always do a loop biopsy or a hysterectomy for, actually turn into cancer? The actual answer is only 18% of them become cancer in five years and 36% in 10 years. So CIN3, which is a high-grade precancerous lesion, only one-third of them turn into cancer. That is, if you don't treat them for 10 years, we are never not going to treat them. We're going to treat them. But even if you don't treat them, actually, majority of them will just stay like that, will not turn into cancer. So we're not dealing with an urgent emergency kind of situation here. And when you're doing your VIAC and treat, we talked about cryocautery. I want to talk about Electrodiathermy is a definite no, we will discuss that. And then the other thing I want you to know about is what's called cold coagulation. That is the current latest fashion. If you want to do the excision method, if you want to remove and send something for histology, which is a correct way of actually doing something, then you do a loop or a LETS, which is you use a loop of wire and you remove the abnormal area. Anybody who has done it under local or under general know how a technically challenging procedure this is. If you go too deep, you can get a big artery to bleed and then that's very difficult to control. People can go into vasovagal shock. Halfway through your procedure, the woman could scream in pain and then you just don't know to continue or to stop. It just is a very, very technically challenging procedure. So many of us in India just end up doing hysterectomies for CIN two and three just to avoid a problem in future. Cryotherapy, which we saw uses freezing gas, liquid nitrogen. It has a very good success rate. After you do cryo for a CN treat, you bring them back after 12 months to look to do another visual inspection with acetic acid. It causes a frostbite. So you ask this woman not to have sex for a few weeks and not and to expect watery discharge. I'm sure you have all had some experience with cryo. And uh, cryo causes an ice ball. The temperatures that reach are minus 50. Imagine how many frostbites you can get at minus 50. So if you touch the vagina, you're in trouble. And the treatment is usually for three minutes. And rare complications, very rare. I've never come across bleeding during cryo, not really. Infection can happen. Freeze burns on the vagina are common. And obviously do not use it if a woman is pregnant. In fact, do not do anything on the cervix if the woman is pregnant other than a pap and other than a punch biopsy if you are suspecting a cancer. Leap procedure of the cervix. And you have to do this to experience what it feels like, but never do it in a small setup. Never do it without senior help because this can be, this can suddenly cause quite a lot of bleeding. And... Uh, and obviously you need diatomy, you need um, insulated speculum, you need a suction machine. 
And this is only for those who have done more than few hundreds that they should be con confident about this. Today, if there is another take home message that is thermal ablation. In 2013 uh, WHO guidelines, there was no mention of thermocoagulation. Back in 2000, 20 years ago, there was a lot of thermal ablation happening in all the developed countries. They used to use it a lot. And for whatever reason, they stopped using it. And in 2019, the latest WHO guidelines say three years ago, these guidelines came, the latest WHO ones, and they clearly say that please use thermal ablation. If you're doing see and treat, think about thermal ablation. And if I can tell you how easy it is and how, uh, you know, how, how literally easy is the only word I can use because that's how easy it is. Anybody can use it. It takes 40 seconds. And the good thing is it takes 10 seconds to heat up and 10 seconds to cool down. So you will never cause a burn on the vagina because it doesn't, it's not hot when it's going in. It's not hot when it comes out. It comes back to room temperature within 10 seconds. And it only takes 40 seconds. So the chances of your hand shaking, your arm aching, the vaginal walls collapsing is very less because 40 seconds, most people can tolerate that. And, but the only bad thing is like cryo, like, uh, uh, like cryo, you don't get a specimen. You're just literally killing off the cells. And therefore you have a VIA lesion. You want to destroy it. You don't want this woman to get uh, CIN in future, then destroy it, use the thermocoagulation. The machine's not expensive at all. It comes in a suitcase like thing and it runs on a battery. So you can take it wherever you want and you can recharge your batteries, 40 seconds, gone. You know, the lesion is gone. So this works very well. For cryo, you need a cylinder. You need the liquid nitrogen cylinder. For this, you just need a battery set up like a small suitcase like this. That's it. It's as big as your handbag. And it's an alternative to cryo. And it's suitable for low grade. If you think this woman has high grade lesion, there is a very strong acetovite lesion. There's a lot of vascularity. You think it's CIN. You better send this woman to a colposcopy center where you can take a biopsy because they could have microinvasion. Maybe that woman needs not thermal coagulation, but something else. So if you think it's a low grade lesion and you want to see and treat the woman on the same day, by all means use thermocoagulation, which WHO strongly recommends. And But the preferable way is take a loop and send it for histology. If you can't do that, then don't need to. And there is no need for anesthesia for thermocoagulation. There is no need for anesthesia for cryo either. And neither of these procedures actually need antibiotics, though sometimes you might want to give antibiotics after cryo because of the amount of watery discharge and everything that happens afterwards. If something goes up to 100 degrees, if your device goes up to 100 degrees, the thermocoagulation, it automatically sterilizes you itself. So then you don't need to put it in an autoclave because 100 degrees, nothing grows there. So this machine doesn't need sterilization. You use it, you clean it with just a sanitizer, and then you clean, use it on another woman. And therefore, because it's such a sterile, auto-sterile procedure, you don't need antibiotics. And nurses can do it. You know, in my setup, when we go on uh, screening camps, nurses do it. So this is a very small setup. It's portable, it's monopolar. So it doesn't need, uh, so your earthing doesn't need to happen. It's battery operated. You can even plug it into an electric socket. The probe goes up to 100 degrees for a minute and it heat and cool within 10 seconds. And a paper in Lancet in 2019 clearly said that it's as good as cryo for treating cervical lesions. But if you think the woman has a precancer or cancer, please don't use this. Please take biopsies and send her. Very little about cervical cancer. I'm not going to do any teaching on cervical cancer. All I want to sell, tell you, remind you, is majority are squamous, very minority are adenocancers. And the minority adenocancers obviously might not get picked up on your pap smear. Even the adenocancers are caused due to HP, we just remember that much. And uh, one thing, again, I want to emphasize is about 20% of cervical cancers, about 20% are happening in women over 65 years. In most countries where women are regularly screened, they say stop screening after the age of 65. But we can't apply that to India. For example, I get a 70-year-old woman to the master health area because that is when Indians come for master health checkup, you know, at 70s, at 60s, because that's when they start to feel a bit under the weather. So in that woman, 
woman, I still do a pap, you know, she's more than 65, but that is her first pap and that might pick up a CI and that might pick up a dyscariotic lesion. So don't look at the age and say, okay, she's too old for a smear. Nobody is too old for a smear because so many of these cancers are happening to older women. And uh, just a few clinical scenarios for you to think about, you know, because you might come across them like I do. And what is the commonest cause of inflammation? We just talked about inflammation and we said, we're not going to treat all inflammations. I don't treat almost 70, 80, 90% of my inflammatory smears at all because the commonest cause is, the commonest cause I see is, hang on. The, what is the commonest cause of uh, inflammation? It's ectropion. We all know ectropion is a physiological phenomenon. It happens when the cervix everts itself out. And if it's a physiological thing, which is causing inflammation on a smear, why am I treating physiological things? So I don't. If I see an ectropion, I don't recommend uh, cryotherapy. But if a woman is repeatedly getting inflammatory smears, second smear, third smear, six months, every six months she has an inflammatory smear, or she has contact bleeding during sexual intercourse, or she has excessive vaginal discharge, which is bothering her, then I might consider doing a cryotherapy. And uh, next question, why not use ball cautery? I've seen some people do. Instead of buying the thermocoagulation or getting the cryo cautery, which are the recommended ways of treating uh, ectropia, which are the recommended ways of treating VIA, I, I see some people take this woman to theater or even in the colposcopy clinic, just use the normal diatomy. And the answer is never ever use ball diatomy we use for our routine surgeries for cervix because uh, I didn't put the answer. Sorry, I got my slides a bit jumbled up today because your diathermy, which you use in your operating theater, burns the lesion for three millimeters. That, that's it. The depth of burn is three millimeters. When you're using cryo, when you're using thermocoagulation or when you're doing a loop biopsy, your depth of destruction is seven millimeters. You need to go seven millimeters deep to destroy these lesions. Otherwise, you're only taking the superficial layer off and within six months, all the abnormal cells will start to show up. So what benefit have you done by using ball diathermy? You haven't gone deep enough. So please don't do that because I've seen so many people do that. Just everybody has a diathermy machine, just use it. You think it's gone, it's not gone. And ball diathermy leaves gaps between two applications. You used a ball, you used a ball, you used a ball. What about that small junction between two balls? You know, each time you apply it, you were not destroying the abnormal cells there and they then turn into something more serious. So please please don't use ball diatomy just because you have it and you don't have a thermocoagulator or a cryotherapy, you need to get it. I have a question for you. Which of these is a best test? Say, which of these will guarantee that you won't end up being a cervical cancer patient? A pap test, a HPV test, you think both are equally good or you think neither of them are good enough? If you were the patient, if you were going for cervical screening, would you go for pap or would you go for HPV? Which is better? Which gives you a stronger reassurance? The answer is HPV. Of all the tests we have so far, VIA, PAP, and HPV, the HPV is the best. That is why we say a HPV test done every five years is good enough. Uh, th this is a question. A single negative HPV test is sufficient to reassure reassure you that you're at a low risk of cancer for the next five years. Is this true or is this false? If you have a negative HPV, does it mean that your risk of cancer is very low? The answer is actually true. That is why we say one HPV test every five years is enough. The answer is true. The next question, is HPV better than PAP? HPV testing predicted future disease much better than PAP. Is that true or false? And it is actually true. It is far better than PAP test. And what do you do? You know, in some pathology report, you see there are no endocervical cells on pap smear. What do you do? Is that a worry? Is that a concern? Should you repeat your pap? And the answer is no. If the endocervical cells are absent on pap, that's fine. As long as the cervical cells are okay because this happens in women who have a very tight external loss or in postmenopausal women and it is nothing to be worried about as long as the woman previously had a normal pap otherwise just repeat it in six months time and what do you see if you what do you do if you see atypical glandular cells on a smear 
immediately get on the phone with a gynae oncologist and send this woman for colposcopy, endocervical biopsies, endometrial biopsies, or do them yourself. But do not just say that we will repeat it in six months. Atypical glandular cells on a smear is something you should really panic about. Why is this is the answer to that diathermy thing? Because diathermy only goes up to three millimeters and you should at least take five to seven millimeter depth with your cryo or thermocoagulation. Why don't you use balls? Same reason. Another question, 23 year old requesting vaccine as she's getting married soon, would you give it? She's not nine to 16. Of course you would give it. She's for three doses of Gardasil or Cervarix. A 12 year old took one dose, and then COVID came, she forgot to take or she couldn't take her second dose because a 12 year old only takes two doses. What do you do? It's been a year and a half. She should have had her second dose or whatever. If someone doesn't have the sec hasn't had the second dose of HPV at the scheduled time, leave it alone. Because the second dose works as a booster. It's enhancing the capacity of the first dose. So if the person can afford it, give it. If the person can't afford it, even the one dose will do a job. But you don't need to start the whole course again. Just give it when you can. And even if you didn't give it, I don't think it will do much harm. Because in India, there is this policy of single dose uh, vaccine so that we can give more vaccines to more number of people rather than keep on giving boosters to people who limited number of people. You all have to be aware of the IFCPC nomenclature. So when you do your acetic acid, you know, depending on how strong the acetovite lesion is, how it looks, you have to mentally imagine if it is a low grade or a high grade. And this is something you have to see the pictures and uh, and there is a lot what I meant, you know, when you do VIA, how do you tell it's low grade or high grade? The sources of information for you to read is the WHO guidelines 2019. There is an eight or 10 page guideline, which is extremely good, very informative. And then the FOXY one is also very informative from 2019. If you go through this, go through these two guidelines, you will know almost everything you should. And facts about HPV, uh, a lot of even educated uh, people, when you tell them that HPV vaccination is good to protect their children from sexually transmitted infection and future cancer, they're like, my child is not like that. It's not about what your child is like. Every child will eventually turn into an adult and will want to explore about sexual activity. And a study has clearly said that in women who are virgins who have never had penetrative intercourse, 46% of them were, were HPV positive prior to their sexual debut. If a woman never had sex, how did she get HPV? But 46%, this study was done in India on a lot of women going to a particular university in Delhi. And they found out that they gave them cotton swab, cotton uh, earbud like things, the cotton swab and charcoal swab type things. And they had to take a swab and send it back in a questionnaire and just answer one question Have you ever been, have you ever had vaginal sex or not? And 46% of them said they didn't have sex, but they had HPV. And the swab was taken from the groin, you know, from the area just next to the labia majora. So how was it positive if they were never positive, if they never had sex? And no, sorry, the swab was taken from lower vagina, but, but these women were never sexually active. So obviously it tells you that it's skin to skin contact. A lot of college girls who do consultations with me, they might not have had penetrative sex, but they just like to cuddle up, you know, they just like to explore, experiment and kiss and have oral sex because they don't want to get pregnant. They want to try other means and so on. So HPV is actually very common even in girls who are not sexually active. So never for once think that, okay, my child hasn't had sex, so she won't need the vaccine or I can get it done later when she's ready for marriage because by by then, due to whatever they do in college with their peers these days, they might become HPV positive. And uh, my nearly ending slide, how many of you are actually eligible? By that, I mean, how many of you 
have been sexually active are sexually active how many of you are married and you're supposed to be having a hpb test or a pap smear every three to five years and how many of you have not had it i'm sure there'll be a few of us saying yes i have not been regular with my spear or hpb because we think we are very clean we think we are in a monogamous relationship we trust our husbands too much and we don't belong to the poor personal hygiene category. We eat well, we eat healthy, we are not from low socioeconomic status, we don't have HIV, we don't use tobacco, we haven't been on COCP for too long. The reason why a long duration of COCP users have HPV is not because COCP does anything to HPV. If a woman is on COCP, her boyfriend obviously will not use condoms. Her boyfriend or boyfriends, how many other people she has slept with, will obviously not use condoms because this girl will tell them, I'm on the pill, I won't get pregnant, you do not need to use a condom. And that is condoms do not stop HPV infections, but they do give some protection. So COCP basically means lack of other barrier contraception, which basically means that more risk of HPV. So my, I go back to my question, how many of us think that we are not actually at risk candidates for cervical cancer and therefore it's okay if I don't get my pap, it's okay if I don't get a HPV test. What about genetic factors? How do you know you don't have a mutation? However healthy and a fitness freak and a nutritionally top candidate you are, how do you know you don't have a mutation where a simple HPV in your cervix could turn into something nasty? So many of our cervical cancer patients are highly educated, you know, very uh, from very good families, very clean families, eat well, exercise well, but still they get cervical cancer. So please, if any of you are due for a PAP or a HPV, please get it done because genetic factors also play a role. If we are carriers of some mutate mutant genes, then one fine day when you're slightly immunosuppressed, when you're stressed out, that mutation could turn a CIN cell, a low-grade abnormality into high-grade, which then will turn into a cancer. So none of us are immune to cancer. And this is one slide I show to all the schools and college girls and ladies when I go to give health talk. This whole pap smear costs 1200, HPV test costs around 4000. The HPV vaccination, the entire schedule costs around 4000, 3000. And what do you actually get for anything less than 5000 these days? You could be free of cervical cancer. The rest, everything you get for less than 5,000 won't last even a day or a month or anything. We so happily spend money, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 on pieces of clothing, on jewelry, on in boutiques. But when it comes to having a PAP, HPV, or you know something which protects your life, people think so much. They're like, okay, we'll get it done next time. I'll think about it later. I Every time I take a gynae history, my first, one of the first questions I ask is, when was the last time you had a PAP? I won't say, did you have a PAP? I'll just say, when was the last time? And if they say never, then I really look at them very awkwardly and say, you never had a PAP test? As if they've done something really bad. And I try my best to encourage, but 10, 50% of people I try my best to encourage don't end up having it. They think it's a waste of money. So sometimes you just have to put things into perspective and try your best, you know, because we actually can be gynecologists can make a hell of a difference to cervical cancer prevention. And that is my last slide. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, ma'am, for an excellent uh, presentation. We are very honored and learning to hear you, ma'am. So, ma'am, uh, if you allow me, then we'll take the questions. Yeah. Yeah, please, Dr. Somesh. Yeah. Uh, ma'am, we have a first question. Uh, mm -hmm. That is surgical options for stage 1A2 and uh, 2A cervical cancer. Sorry, stage 1A2 surgical option is a radical hysterectomy, bilateral pelvic lymph node dissection. 
anything more than stage 1B1. Stage 1B1 is uh, less than four centimeters of cervical tumor. Stage 1B2 is more than, four, more than four centimeters. So if a cervical tumor is more than stage 1B1, we do not offer surgery because they will invariably need radiation therapy. So whoever asked this question, how do you what surgery do you do for stage two cancer? We don't do surgery. We're not supposed to do surgery. We are supposed to offer them radiation. Saying that in some centers, they do do radical hysterectomy for stage two A and then give them radiation therapy, but that none of the college guidelines, no guidelines says you should offer surgery for anything more than stage one B1. For 1A1, you do a simple hysterectomy, pelvic node dissection. For 1A2, you do a radical hysterectomy. Thank you very much, ma'am. We have second question, ma'am. That is the duration of protection of uh, HPV vaccination. It's meant to protect people for life. Yeah, because vaccines came into the market about 15 years ago. And they've been doing studies on Americans where the vaccination started for the last 15 years and they have found that the immunity levels are still maintained. So a vaccine which has only been there for the last 15 years, we know that it works for 15 years. We don't know what will happen 10 years later, but the way the antibody titers have been maintained all this time, it's believed that they will last for, the, for life. It's like hepatitis B. And when a newborn is born, you give hepatitis B vaccination, but then we don't repeat it. Yeah, because we expect it to last for their life. Same thing with HPV. Thank you, ma'am. There's a one more question from... Rojni, uh, pelvic recurrences of cervical cancer. Pelvic recurrences of cervical cancer. I don't exactly know what you are trying to ask, but if a cervical cancer has recurred, then we are in some kind of trouble because the woman if she hasn't had radiation the first time, if she had surgery and the cancer recurred, that's rare because you only offer surgery with a curative intent. If the cancer has recurred, then you give radiation therapy. That's good. And with every radiation therapy to cervical cancer, you add a little bit of chemo. You call it chemo radiation. But if you have had recurrence after the woman had primary radiation, say cervical cancer patient had radio chemo radiation, then the cancer recurred, then you can't give radiation because it's a heavily radiated field. Then you have to either give chemotherapy or you have to operate. If it's a pelvic recurrence, then are you removing the uterus? Is the disease close to the bladder? Do you have to remove, do an anterior pelvic clearance, remove the bladder and the uterus? Or is it between the bladder and the rectum? And do you have to do a posterior pelvic clearance? That depends on where the pelvic recurrence is. If it's on the external iliac artery and vein, then you're not going to remove them, then you might have to give chemotherapy. So recurrence after what? Recurrence after surgery, recurrence after chemo radiation, that will give you a correct answer. Thank you very much, ma'am. Is that it, Dr. Swam? Yes, ma'am. I think there are no more questions from the delegates. If mm -hmm. there are any, definitely we'll pass it on to your mail ID. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, ma'am, uh, for your uh, uh, giving you a valuable time. And sorry for disturbing your busy hours. No and problem. It makes me study as well, you know, so it's good. It's mutually beneficial. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. We look forward for your continued support as well. Sure. Thank you very much, ma'am. And many thanks from the SHIELD team. Thank, thank you, SHIELD. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. I also thank all the delegates for actively participating in the webinar.